Welcome to Mac 1010. What I'm standing on right here was a load bank for nuclear submarines. This was floated around the world and plugged into submarines to test them. But now our mission is to turn this into a floating power station. Ironically, just as we've prepared the set to explain the reason why we're here and why we need to provide power to the boat, the power is just cut again. Oh, it's back on. No. <laughs> Basically, someone has bought it and converted it into a seriously nice luxury living accommodation, which I'm going to show you around. Um, but the plan is to make it so that they actually have reliable off-grid power, because at the minute, this huge vessel that someone is living in is running off of this tiny little shore power box, which is actually only 16 amps. And you can see the state of it. This SY cable is literally just peeling off in my hands. Anything that is subjected to these harsh environments has to be really, really designed for it. And these SY cables, as soon as you get a nick in them, that's it, the whole thing will just rust out and corrode. 16 amps is just not enough to power this whole boat, but they can't have anything bigger pulled out here because that would mean basically rewiring this whole pontoon. The other alternative is what we're doing. We're putting in a wind turbine and a whole load of solar panels. So I'm gonna show you around that. Oh, open it, look, there's a fish. Oh, look, wow, the size of those ones. I think, that is a mullet, but either way, I don't really plan on fishing those because I'm pretty sure the poop from this boat's just get flushed straight into the water. I think with a mullet, the trick is to cut the sides just right and leave a nice little bit enough to get a ponytail. Yeah, that's not funny. If you want to catch a mullet, you need a white claw attached to a rope and tie that rope to a tree. So when they come and <coughs> onto the white claw drink, you've got them. We'll leave them be. Right, let me show you around the electrical system. So the power comes in from the shoreline out there into this quattro inverter and then out and into the property. So what this enables you to do is beef up that supply. So if you've only got 16 amps over there, then all of these batteries will basically top up that supply. So if you ever need more than 16 amps, then it will give you that. However, even though you've got a ton of batteries here, these are lead assay batteries and there's only actually 16 kilowatt hours of battery storage here. And when you do the maths on it being lead acid, you should never really deep cycle that. So in actuality, you only have eight kilowatt hours of usable battery storage. So our plan is we're gonna put in a 15K inverter, which will triple his AC capacity. We're gonna be putting 32 solar panels on the roof. So he's actually generating his own electricity. We're gonna be putting in a wind turbine. So he's making use of that wind blowing off of the harbor, taking out all of these batteries. And we're gonna be putting in 75 kilowatt hours of proper LIFE PO4 batteries. Step one, decommission all of this stuff. There's a lot of work and a lot of heavy lifting and it's really cold. There's that water running, that's running down that cable. Oh, so you yeah, see so that, the water there, that's tracking down the cable from outside where it's that explosed that's... connector. It's wow. tracked down that entire length of cable. That is so and interesting. It. On the other side of this um, hole, I'll show you, there's a crane and there are some seriously dodgy connections on there. And uh, that's on our list of things to fix that we're gonna come to. So we're getting the water here is tracking its way all the way down, all the way along that cable length, all the way around and up onto that hole to the crane. I'll show you the other side of it now. Right, so this is the crane here. And as you can see, th this is the terminals. This is the connections that we're dealing with. So that water has managed to capillary through there, all the way down, round this cable, up over that and hockey stick down across and round into the hole so that's quite amazing however we actually really want to use this crane now i'm going to offer the customer to make it safe because i didn't actually see the state of this <laughs> but this was connected directly onto the battery system so one stormy day them two close in that would have been an almighty bang um because you would have had the full discharge of all those lead acid batteries. If we can tapey muck tape it up, at least just use it temporarily. And the, and the kid in me is absolutely excited to use the crane. God, they're, they're really heavy. I'm glad they've only got to go out of a hatch. Use those gym muscles. Gym muscles? Do you gym think, muscles. Do you think I have gym muscles? <laughs> That's the nicest thing someone said to me all week. 60.5 kilograms in that. 133 pounds for your uh, American watches. How do you do these maths in your head? It's written on the top. Oh. <laughs> there is a safe working load limit here, but it, it, I can't actually see what it says because it's rubbed out. So I'm gonna presume that says 700 kilos. We've decommissioned all of that old stuff. And then let's see if we can use this crane to deliver all of our new stuff inside. Power on to the crane, yeah? So now we've got 24 volts to this. We've got the controller plugged in. It should, in theory, just operate that winch. Brilliant. 
But look at his little face. That gives me so much joy. To rotate it, it's just a manual operation. I wonder if that would take my weight. That sounds crunchy, mate. Oh! <laughs> this is some Tom Cruise stuff happening right here. I reckon that'll take you back. Oh, my microphone. You actually dropped it. Shall I see if I can get to it? I don't know how deep that water is. Maybe he has some outriggers. Maybe I should just stop before it gets even more disastrous. <sighs> Flippin' heck. Well, that was expensive. You don't know until you know. Now we know. All right, I reckon that's safe to use, so we could probably start getting equipment, drop down inside now and get those old batteries up and out. All right, cool. All right, so the plan is, we've got these Unistrap win window brackets, and what they do is, they work by friction, basically. So the Unistrap goes through that hole, and then that screws in, and that will hold everything steady and in place. So that inverter is going to mount there, and then we're gonna have these 41 mil Unistrap pieces going down, then we'll have some 21 mil Unistrap going across, and then all of our trunking, we're gonna have some metal trunking mounted to here. The batteries will go on underneath, and then we'll have all of the controls and everything else up here for the uh, links distributor and everything. So it should be quite a cool little setup. I'm having a real dilemma at the minute, right? Because here's the thing. I actually love doing these types of jobs. I want to be hands-on. I want to be able to do everything. I don't want to be faffing around on the phone or handling emails or business calls or anything like that. I'd rather be on the tools because that's what I enjoy doing. When I started this business, the whole idea was I want to do nice high quality installs and I want to do it on my terms. It wasn't that I want to hire a load of subbies and a load of employees and have like this empire while I just sit back <laughs> and reap the benefits. I want to be in the trenches and doing the work. And I feel like days like today, I'm getting FOMO on my own jobs because I, I see bits happening without me because I'm having to handle the next job and then the job after that and then the job after that, whether it be emails, calls, planning, design, um, applications, all this kind of stuff. So I'm like, oh, I either need to hire someone else to go into the office with me to actually help me push that side of things so that I can be on the tools and just concentrate on being on the tools or I need to hire another employee so that I have like a set day where I'm working. But I'm hoping by the time you see this video, I'll have something in place. I'm not sure exactly what it is yet, but by the time you see it, something's gonna happen. And all I do know is it's gonna be very exciting. I got your screws. Trouble is, you can't use the spirit level on this boat because the boat itself, you can feel when you're sitting here, is rocking around. So how, that, on, how on earth do you find true level on a boat? You can measure off of these beams, but these beams have a bow to them as well. So these are what the batteries actually can mount onto basically. So you can either mount them on their feet or mount them by these. I think what we'll probably try and do is do a bit of both. So I want to have the least amount of weight as possible on all of these welds, even though they are, they are solid. Um, I want to try and keep that in there to stop them from falling forwards and the feet to sort of take the weight of them. That's one problem solved. <gasps> oh, come on! It's deeper now. Oh. Oh. There we go. All right, now problem number two. I decided to start the day with some lovely cinematic drone shots. I've had a bit of a mishap. Didn't know there was another wall there. So currently, that's the view. <laughs> There's an RAF base here, like a naval base, and they use signal jammers. And I suspect it could have been a signal jammer, or it could have been horrendous piloting. I'm suspecting the first. What a rubbish way to start the day. That's a proper pee on your morning parata. Oh, it's, it's gonna get really deep once we pass the rocky stage. Ah, look at that. I'm living Bournemouth Pete's dream life. <laughs> Sorry, crab. Ah, oh, there he is. Oh. Well, that's why it crashed. The arm fell off. That wasn't my fault after all. Right, so that drama aside, the job for this morning is to get all of these panels shifted up and over onto the boat. <laughs> I 
I'll tell you what's quite a cool thought. As we're sort of here looking out at the sea and the port and all the waters, do you think this boat has got some serious history to it, which I can't help but geek out over. I have been doing a bit of research on it and I'm gonna share some of the news articles about this boat. But this, this boat, well now it's more of a barge, but it did have a big engine in it. And it's been everywhere, it's been all around the Caribbean. Basically the function of it, there was a massive resistor inside. So if you needed to test something, you do it now. You have, if you have a big generator or a big engine, you have no load testing, and then you have a load bank test. So no load testing is sort of like revving your car or revving your diesel engine with no, without it being in gear, it's sort of, it might puff a bit of smoke out, but not much is gonna happen. When you have a load bank, it simulates a load. So say with the generator, you might just have a big resistor bank. And what it will do is it will take that power and just effectively turn it into heat. And then that load enables you to properly function test that engine and keep it healthy as well. So they had to go often wherever the submarine was, which I find so cool. But what I like even more is that it's gone from being a massive resistor or a massive drain of power to now being a little floating power station with wind, solar, everything kind of contrary to what it was originally built for. Cool, eh? <laughs> Sorry. This camera is an absolute beast. I get asked a lot about how I get shots like this. Or like this. And I do it all with this Insta360 camera. Now, the beauty of it is, I don't have to worry about where I point it. It's 360 degrees. Say you're snowboarding or whatever it is that you're doing that requires action camera. You just point it around like that. You can even look a bit like a drone shot. And it deletes the selfie stick. So it makes that selfie stick completely invisible, which is awesome for any sort of action sports or creativity as well. Like, I don't know. Say for example, you want to get into running. I don't know, whatever else it is that you do, whatever else it is that floats your boat, literally. For a limited time only, you can get your hands on one of these using my discount code below. Go check it out. Okay, so basically yesterday we got a lot of the inside done, so we're making the most of this little weather window, if you could even call it that, to get all of the rails on. We have these clamps which compress around the standing seam and then the rails sit on top of that. We actually have three rails on this side. Reason being the wind uplift is gonna be absolutely ridiculous. I did think about doing some solar skirt on there, but I'm kind of worried that the wind might even take that away. So we're, we're opting instead for an extra rail, keeping it tight to the roof. I'll show you one of these close up and then I'm gonna go get cabling. So these are the fixings here, and this is a special type of fixing which goes on to this type of roof. This type of roof is called a standing seam roof. It's where you have the individual sheets of steel that are bent or aluminium or whatever they are pushed together and then crimped together. Um, so you use this type, which is a compression fixing, because you don't want to be penetrating holes in this roof. So that just clamps on like so. And then two little grub screws, tighten those up. I'm not gonna nip it up all the way because we still need to run the string along here. The rail basically screws in and it's as simple as that. Quite a simple little solution really, and it will be very effective. You've got those little teeth there, which will bite on underneath, hook themselves on underneath the actual standing seam itself. So. As I say, we'll leave Jonathan to get on with those and I'm gonna go get some cables pulled in. It's funny because we can't really have a two-way conversation because my other mic is in the water. What I really hope is that there's some kind of Caribbean crab that's in the water and he's doing something or saying something to the microphone and hopefully they get picked up. What is this idiot bubbling about? That island is sus. A thousand percent they're hiding something on there. There's no way that you can have an island like that and not hide something on there. If they're not, then I want to hide something on there. We're floating now, Wilson. Look, if you do this fast enough, I reckon we'll be able to tip the boat up. Move the string line down. This is so much exercise. All right, so the next row we're putting there, the panels are going to be pretty much touching at the centre because we want the wind to go over. We're going to have these 200 mil down from the centre and then the bottom panel, we're going to have it 100 mil up from the centre so that it's got more support that way. And then we're adding an additional row to what is necessary down the centre here just for that extra bit of support on it. I'm actually having to be a bit careful so we don't stack it. We're putting these rails on now, but the waves, even though they're only small, when you're up here, because of the, the movement of the narrowness of the boat, it's like, it should end up having to surf. We've been very assured by the client that this is structurally ready for the wind uplift that comes from solar panels. 
but uh, you can't help but be a little bit frightened when you get a gust of wind come across and you remember how powerful the winds are because you've got the Isle of Wight, obviously gun wharf keys and that, and then the, the wind just comes round here so fast, it really whips in. That little wind turbine is gonna be pooping its guts out. Right, so we're ready to panel, but before we panel, we have to get all the cables up. So all the cables are going to be sitting underneath the panels themselves. So we've got all of this side of it prepped. As you can see, we're coming out of the Vitron inverter onto the Lynx distributor. So we've got the shunt here. So we can have all the batteries on one side of the shunt. So 75 kilowatt hours of battery storage, and then all of the solar off of the MPPTs on this side. And then that connects into the inverter, and then out of the inverter, up and into the apartment. So we can be doing that side. But as I say, first things first, get wired up. So this cable is made by Doncaster Cables and it's a four core solar cable. Danger, DC voltage, live during daylight. So that's handy. You've got the proper double insulated cable inside of it. But then you've also got this outer insulation jacket. So it just saves us having to worry about the external influences here so much. Being out at sea, not really comfortable just want running cables on their own. I'd want them inside of some kind of conduit or something just to protect them a bit extra. This has got that outer jacket of insulation just to protect the cable. So we're going to be running that up onto the roof for the various strings. So let's do it. The plan is I'm going to get this stripped. I'm going to get this cable tied on to the roof before the weather really turns so we can start getting some panels on. And then they are going to be down there routing the cable down and into the plant room. My lovely wife has gone to the local wholesaler to get some materials for us and she's been absolutely ripped off. She doesn't know what things she's cost. She's picked up a gland and some pea clips and she's been told, she's just called me and said, oh, is 75 pounds okay? Maybe in Norway. I'm so fuming. Why can't people just do honest business trying to rip people off like that? Hi. Hi, love. Yeah, that, that price is not right. So would you mind just going in and passing the phone over to them, please? Hello. Hi, mate. Um, is it 50 quid for a cable gland, 50 pound 95? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's, that's a bit ridiculous, isn't it, don't you think? Can you review those prices? Just because I know we haven't got an account there, but still, I know we've sent a woman in, but there's no need to give absolutely ridiculous prices like that, mate. That's borderline just cheeky. Unbelievable. I'm just trying to do my, well, I'm sorry you're just trying to do your job, but if you're not able to do your job, mate. there's a difference between, I've been here three weeks, I didn't know a three pound item should be 50 pounds, 25. Right, let's crack on with the job. Right, so the last thing to do before we can go up on the roof and actually start paneling is get the AC cable in. So we've got this armored cable here, which we're glanding off. Now I had some people, I said some people, I had one person in that last 11,000 volt video saying, oh, your tools are too small, basically criticizing me for having a small, banner um well guess what <laughs> yeah well i don't listen to comments what's that excessive immoderate i don't say immoderate i prefer to say i'm moderate Right, so this roof is actually off of the Gosport Ferry, which is quite a cool little fact, but my plan is now to put the end caps on the end of the rails first, because they're gonna be quite inaccessible once all the panels are on them. But these rails are so nice. All right, so once we've got the six on this side, we can do the six on that side, and then we're not sort of painting ourselves into a corner. Really faffy and complicated, because you can't really overreach, because overreaching just means instant swimming. I don't really fancy going full Tom Daly today. I mean, he might as well. He's showing most of what he's got anyways. There'll probably still be someone saying, why have you installed it in a shady environment? Um, but even though the sun isn't really shining today, these cables will still have voltage on them now, so we should treat them as such. So we don't really want to terminate this end until, until that is all done. Nothing much to say, but I'm listening to a podcast on stress at the minute realized I may have it and it says to avoid things that cause it and I've realized work causes my stress so I might just go on the dull sounds pretty sick so we've got all the panels bar two up on the roof and we've just run out of daylight so what we're gonna have to do now is cut the rails a little bit shorter 
and adjust a couple of bits. So we're gonna leave that for tomorrow. But that means now we're on the dash to get them some power for tonight. At the minute, all we've got is the old 16 amp feed in going directly into their distribution board. And every time they boil the kettle, it's tripping even quicker now. So uh, it's not enough to run their house. So what we're going to do is connect it up so that we've just got these two batteries on and have a supply out for tonight so that they've got something. And then tomorrow, it'll just be a case of finishing touches tomorrow then, so. Right, so the DC cables come off the roof, round the edge, up inside this little hockey stick and into that corner, but it's all the way up there. And to try and get a ladder in here and get it to lean on the thing is a bit impossible. So I'm just gonna have to kind of go Spider-Man on it because we need it to come along the top and down the edges. But anyway, I see this really doable is just to climb past my drill, please. Oh, wow, there's a crawl space above the whole boat. That's really good to know. Oh, the electric's up here. There you go, this is my view right now. And then we've got this absolute shocker there. And uh, all the way down to the end of the boat. It's late and I would quite like to be at home or in the bath. Sorry to put that image in your head. But it is moments like this where I'm like, do you know what? I love my job. I'm in a boat. Oh, the battery's dead on that. I take it back, I don't love my job anymore. All right, so the cables are down and in now. So they come in through there and they're gonna come straight into these isolators. So this is the front of the boat. I wanna try and do it in a way that kind of makes sense. These are connected up that end. So I need to get this done tonight really because in the morning when the sun comes back out, these will be live again. When you're on a stuffing land, you always wanna just have a little bit of the outer jacket coming in where possible. This can be cut about here now. We did this in the daytime, <laughs> be a big bang. You can see in a situation like this why the PV Ultra cable is so nice. Rather than just have bare strings down and into here, it's all properly insulated. And you've got to really watch out on these isolators because they're so easy to wire up wrong. Because some isolators go straight through like that, like that would make sense. And I don't know if it's because of the way the terminals are laid out inside, but these ones cross over. So they go basically one, two, three, four. So they zigzag across each other. So you just have to be a little bit careful of that. Now the other guys have gone home, it's a lot quieter. The banter's gone. Just have to banter with myself. Why did the chicken cross the road? To find himself. All right, sweet. They're wired in. This cruddy cable here, where the water has managed to track its way all the way through, that is the old supply cable, so that will be coming out tomorrow and be replaced with a proper HO7. Um, but for now, we're ready now tomorrow to wire up from here into the MPPTs, from the MPPTs into the Lynx distributor. The Lynx distributor already is wired into the inverter. It's time to cut some tray. Sorry if you've got a northern grandmother that you're missing and that made you think of her. Now we're gonna manufacture a tray bend most people can only dream of. Get the grinder, and even if you look lame, wear your PPE, guys. Wearing PPE is so cool. It's so in right now. So my plan is to get that to slide round and into there. Flipping yellow tools, run out of battery. Sorry for my inability to cut this tray. It appears my tools are accidentally yellow. Be right back. Pretty much bang on. Just need to make a little open in there. Probably need to trim a bit more off of that, I reckon. There we go. So now we've got a lovely 90 degree set. Because I folded it over, um, it's completely gap free. And once I put a bolt there, a bolt there, or you can do a pop rivet, and a bolt there and a bolt there, that'll be absolutely bulletproof. All right, so all of these connections here all have to be talked up to approximately 14 Newton meters. So this right here is the M12 torque wrench. And it's perfect because it will start it off for you. There you go. And it will give you an indication, a little color coded indication when it's up to the perfect torque. So now my job is just to fly through all of these, make sure they're all torqued up perfectly and we're good to go. Right, so that is the PV side of it pretty much done now. So 
the strings are coming down into these isolators and then out into the MPPTs. We've still managed to use all of the offcuts here of the Doncaster cables, which is nice, there's no waste there. So while Johnny is just doing that last string, I'm gonna go up on the roof and start with all the irradiance testing and the DC testing for the solar side. So maybe that'll be something educational. Got my kit here, I'll take you up there. Right, so we're up on the roof now and we've got the finished solar array set down there. I say finished, there's a few little finishing touches to do. But to help us with the testing, we've got Chris over here from Seawood. Now, Seawood basically the industry leaders when it comes to anything PAT testing and anything PV. So for the PV tester that they make, the PV150, they've now got the PV150 plus. So within that package is everything you ever need to test solar. Um, the first test that we'll do, because everything comes back in renewables and in solar to what's called STC or standard test conditions, um, is we measured the irradiance. So the irradiance is energy from the sun measured in watts per meter squared. That is done with this nifty little device here, the Solar Survey 200. That pairs wirelessly to the PV150 Plus. All right, shall we start by taking an irradiance? Sounds good to me. So this is the Solar Survey switched on now. As you can see, it's a very, very cloudy day out there, so we're getting very low readings. So effectively, it's given you around about 80 watts per meter squared. So it's given you a compass bearing there as well. It's not actually given you a temperature here because we'd need to attach the temperature probe to it. Very, very simple to use. So at the moment, it's saying it's swapping between, say, 81, 80, because effectively, the cloud cover is changing, so the irradiance is going to be a bit sporadic um throughout the day so what you do is you pair these together to put this in something called transit mode where you press the temperature key then click ok now what happens is once once these are paired together all the information is incorporated in here so when you're actually doing your testing so if you're doing your insulation resistance test if you're doing your short circuit current etc the information from the Solar Survey 200R would automatically populate into the main PV150 Plus. So when you're actually downloading the results, it would incorporate all the results together, um, all under one roof. Right, now we're on the other side. So what we need to do now is test everything from here up. So from the isolators. So if you had MC4s, you would basically just plug those MC4s into there. Um, we haven't got MC4s here, obviously it's wired into an isolator, so instead we've got test probes. So remember in solar you've got closed circuit voltage and open circuit voltage. You've also got closed circuit current and open circuit current. So we are measuring our open circuit voltage and our short circuit current. Um, and also we want to measure insulation resistance. So we've got these two probes going into the top here. We've also got an earth reference point. So if you have any exposed metal work on the system, basically this will run off to that, clamp on, and then you test against that. So to turn it on, all I'm going to do is hold those two buttons together, like so. So because it's live, I've got my safety gloves on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to test the negative and the positive on each string. And here's just going to push auto test. There we go. So we now know we have 209 volts, 0 0.9 amps short circuit. It's because there's absolutely no sun shining and a pass on insulation resistance. Then I'm just going to save those readings by pushing that. That has now stored it. There we go. 174 volts, 0 0.87 amps, uh, 199 insulation resistance. We're going to save that. And then move across to the next string. There we go. So 209 volts, 0.4 amps and 199 mega ohms so we're going to save those and that is the testing done right so i'm sorry if you're expecting some nice long complicated test video on how to test pv systems but that is the extent of it with the tester that i use now the 150 plus auto test and it does everything for you so and with all of the test results saved onto here that will then be uploaded to my computer where it will automatically populate my dc test certificate for me to then hand over to my customer so just incredibly easy incredibly simple right so now we're tested with a massive thank you to chris as well from seawood um we can move on to actually livening things up and commercially all right some real world sparking now and some real world issues basically we're trying to get the system up and commissioned and then, then we conclude this lovely section of the video. However, we're not able to because the shore supply keeps tripping out. Now, it's complicated for a few reasons, one of which it's part of a marina, so we're not actually able to really touch their side of things. However, it's got a 30 milliamp RCD up front, and there's also a 30 milliamp there. Now, he's got a lot of smart devices, LED drivers, all that kind of stuff, which is just fantastic kit if you're trying to trip out an RCD. So I've measured, and there is some earth leakage. What we're doing now is a ramp test. Okay, yeah, testing. Yeah, again, 21 milliamps. Yeah, there's no leakage on that, so that is 
the RCD is tripping too early. So that means that RCD over there is probably just a bit tired. It could even be the temperature constraints because it's really cold and it's operating in there without a heating element or that kind of thing. The solution will be ask the dock to either put that up to 100 milliamp if their regs allow for that, replace it for a new one, um, or we can do something called galvanic isolation, which is where we could put in a galvanic isolator. It'll be a bit like a shaver socket. It'll be a one-to-one -one transformer, and it'll just completely separate our electrical system from theirs. So all the things that it perceives as fault current won't actually go back that way. It will stay within our little system, tied, neutral earth tied system. Which means that's going to be a solution for another day. Right. Right, we have our solution. This right here is the isolation transformer that I talked about last time. So this will allow us to completely separate from the grid. So it's a one-to-one -one transformer providing separation by magnetism, basically. So what I'm thinking is we stick it just there so the supply cable can come into that and then out and into this. So that any fault currents and issues with the supply will stay out there and anything that we provide in here that provides issues out there will stay in here. So we're two separate systems, parts and ships. And if you recall me, ripping into Alex for him actually paying to run, him going for a paid run. And I was like, why on earth would anyone ever pay to run? You can do it for free. Well, I've just signed up for the half marathon in Bournemouth and I'm doing it for a charity. I'm doing it for the lifeboats charity. That's because they've actually rescued me before. <laughs> That's a long story for another day. I'm going to keep my progression on the channel. Well, hopefully you should see my progression as I get slimmer and slimmer, I hope, until eventually I look like Kipchoge. That way as well, I feel it keeps me accountable to make sure I am training and make sure I am running because my times will be public. So I know people are going to be able to see my times on here. And if, I, if you know 100,000 people are going to see your times, I know I'm going to want to do it in less than 17 hours. Oh, this is solid. And that's because it's just basically two big solid lumps of copper in there. There we go. So what we'll have is the supply cable here. This is going out to the plug on the dock. That will go in. And then we have another cable here coming back out of this and into our system. So yeah, we'll get that wired up. This is a really interesting one, because you see, you've got back there, this is the big copper coil. So that's gonna be part of the transformer. But as we say, the transformation is just one to one. So you've just got in and out. So this, these are gonna be wiring in just there. And then this is gonna be the output just there to the inverter. Because we're isolating and we are, we're floating most of the time, we have to link the line and neutral together in here to effectively make our own TNCS. So I believe it's between these two terminals, J5 and J7. So there's actually a lot of information inside guidance note eight, which is the guidance note made by the IET just for earthing. Um, and within that document, there's a lot around boats and vessels. So you can see here, this is basically explaining the situation we're in now where you're floating and you connect up the hole as part of the TT. It's all very interesting. I don't want to give too much advice because every single situation is going to be unique and different. So you can see what we've done here in this situation. However, that's only with our own research according to the specific parameters that we have in place here. Because even here now we've isolated, if we hadn't have done that link, that would have meant that we wouldn't have had our TN supply, which means that basically in this scenario, if we hadn't have done that link, the RCDs wouldn't have operated correctly, which you would have found at testing, of course, but at least it saves you a little bit of head scratching, doesn't it? All right, so that is us done. So all of the solar panels are on and we are generating. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sharing all of this data publicly through a VRM or a Victron remote monitoring portal and we're going to have a publicly accessible one so you can see all of the data of this and if you notice it, this little wind turbine right behind me. We're going to share the data for that as well. Now if you want to see this wind turbine getting installed, you're going to have to subscribe because that's gone on as part of this job but we've had to film it separately because there's a bit too much meat on the bone for one video. It's times like this as well where I feel like I'm living in the future because I've got all these panels behind me generating away. I've also got this Tesla Starlink just here, 
sending all of that beautiful VRM data to you guys out there over in the clouds and the wind turbine above my head. I absolutely love it. I love my job and I love this and I love that there's geeks like you out there watching it and subscribing, making a lot of this possible. So a massive thank you for watching and for supporting and I'll see you next time. Wind turbine.